Good morning, church. We welcome you this morning in a special way because this is a time when we remember our risen Savior, Jesus. I'm going to say this to you. He is risen. What a way to start our morning. I wonder if you'd stand with me. We're going to begin with prayer. We're going to allow some of our young people to lead us in some songs of praise. We're going to be hearing from a dear brother who's going to share with us something that the risen Lord is doing in our world today. Let's begin with prayer. Our holy Jesus, we thank you that you are alive. It would be difficult for us to imagine living in a world where you are not alive, living in a world where there is only ourselves and hopelessness and loneliness and an end. Instead, you are alive and bring joy and peace and eternal hope for eternal life. We come and we give you praise here in this morning. We give all of ourselves the best of our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our voices we bring to you. And we give this to you now as we worship you in Christ's holy name and amen. Let us worship the Lord.
God reigns, and that's something we can truly be joyful in and rejoice in. He has defeated the grave. He is risen. Low in the grave he lay, Jesus my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose, a oh, victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with the saints to Hallelujah. 
stripes of blood that stain its rain shed to wash away our shame from the scars pure love released salvation by the mercy in the sky between two leaves hung the blameless prince of peace bruised and battered scarred and scorned sacred head pierced by our thorns it is finished was his crime the perfect His sacrifice, our victory, our Savior chose the mercy tree. Oh, in dark that violent day, the whole earth quaked at love's display. Three days silent in the ground, his body. He bore for heaven's crown on that bright and glorious day when heaven opened up the grave. He's alive and risen indeed. Praise him for the mercy tree. Death has died. Let's all be seated, please. It is our church's pattern that on this empty tomb service, we enjoy hearing from someone who has seen what the risen Christ is doing in other parts of the world. Jesus is alive. He is active. He is doing much in various places. And so we usually ask someone to come, and either someone who has lived in or ministered in places that are rather far flung, to say, what is Christ doing around the world today? Today we're going to have a guest to share with us who has been lately spending some time in Nigeria, Africa, and who's going to be able to really focus in a little bit about what's happening there and what Christ has done in his own life. I'd like to introduce to you my friend, Pastor Cliff. Brother Cliff, if you'd be willing to uh, come and take a microphone, and we're going to hear a little bit from Pastor Cliff, and maybe we can go all the way back some years. Tell us, how old are you? I'm 81. 81 years old. Praise the Lord. and it's Praising the Lord. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and I can tell you this. Pastor Cliff has a, an enthusiasm in the Lord that's sort of infectious. 
when I call him, he always answers the phone the same way. He'd answer it this way for you as well. What do you say when I call you? Greetings, salutations, hallelujah, and praise the Lord. That's how he answers the phone. And so now we understand a little of who Pastor Cliff is. You've told me that when you were fairly young, you were in the hospital at some point. The pastor, the evangelist came, prayed for you, and the Lord helped you. How was this? Yes, I had epilepsy. I'd had a seizure and passed out and fallen down a flight of stairs. Uh, came to in the hospital, and there at our church, I was living in New York, the uh, pastor and evangelist came. They laid hands on me and healed me. Uh, the Lord healed me, and I've never had a seizure since. The Lord is good. How old were you then? Uh, I was uh, 11, 12 years old. Something like that. Still later, you've told me that you sought uh, the baptism and filling with the Holy Spirit, and God released you from depression and other things. How old were you then? What happened? Well, I was in major depression for 10 years of my life. I was suicidal during that time. Um, and God delivered me from all that, uh, also with epilepsy. I also had a speech impediment where I couldn't say five words without starting through four of them. And God delivered me of that. Isn't that something? It's amazing. You had a speech impediment and you became a pastor? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. And you've been pastoring, you've told me, for some 55 years? In June, it'll be 55 years. Praise God. Now, one of the things about missions, we're going to get to Africa in just a moment, but you had a heart for missions early on. You got turned down. Yes. Uh, when I went to Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, um, I felt the Lord called me to the mission field. I was president of the Latin American Prayer Group, and my wife and I even served as interns uh, for a summer in Guyana, uh, South America. Um, and so I felt missions is where the Lord's leading me. And then when I graduated from Bible College, um, then I applied and they said, well, you have to be ordained. Oh, okay. So then two years and then I was ordained um, to the Assemblies of God. And then uh, I filled out the application again and they started the process, it said it would take about three or four years. Um, and then I received a letter saying they're no longer processing my application. And I wrote back, why? Never did get an answer. I think what we're saying is that God is sovereign. He knows what he's doing. He had you serve here for many years, and then he opened a door. And I'm going to tell you all how the door opened. <sighs> During the COVID period, so many folks began to have what they did broadcast over the Internet. And... That way, people who were at home might be able to see, and then sometimes people just kept that going so that if there's somebody in the world that needed it, that'd be good. And there was somebody in Africa who needed what you were sharing and contacted you and asked you to come. Yes. Um, and this is recently. A pastor, Pastor Amos from Kenya, um, Africa, and then he contacted me and he said, um, can I use your teachings in my church? Yes. Well, sure. It's all from the Word of God. It's, it's available. And so for three months, I'd been teaching his men, and he invited me to come to Kenya. Um, now, how this ended up happening is two weeks before our um, governor shut down the churches, um, and I was able to install our cameras, and so I had Facebook Live. Um, and from that point on, being able to broadcast that, and he, as well as some others, have been contacting me somehow. Um, uh, with all the thousands and thousands of people on the Internet. And then the uh, Lord opened up that door for me and to then go to, to Kenya and to in Australia. Well, let's meet Pastor Amos, if we could. Uh, well, there we go. There's, there is you and Pastor Amos and his wife, Lynette, and they are in Kissy, Kenya. And this is their home, I think. Is that right? Uh, yes, which has a dirt floor. Okay. Um, there's no electricity there. Uh, it's in the very poor section of the, the country, um, but they're praising God and serving the Lord. You've told me that the pastor is someone who makes his living cutting leaves from the plants to make tea. Correct. And so he does that and doesn't make much doing that, but then in all of his free time, he is reaching people for Christ, teaching them, and is sort of a self-taught pastor and was interested in your help. Yes. Um, he started uh, having a Bible study um, in the area, the community, and after five years, he had enough people to start a church, and now he's got two satellite churches from that church. 
That is wonderful. Let's meet Pastor Amos's family. Here we have a picture of Pastor Amos and his wife. And you've told me that um, four of the children are naturally theirs, and four of them were abandoned ones that they adopted. Yes. Um, he has uh, these four children um, that came, said that um, their mother had died, and grandmother was taking care of them, but grandmother didn't have enough food anymore, and they didn't have anything to eat. So he took them in and so fed them right away. And then he had to go to the chief. Now, in Kenya, they still have their tribes in various areas. And so he had to go to the chief and to tell him what the situation is and then want to know if he would allow him to take those children in. And so he kind of informally adopted those four children, and he already had four children. And what ended up happening when I found that out, um, our church, uh, though it's a small church, um, we voted to, that's our mission project from now until Jesus comes, that we're going to um, supply the food for these four children. So we have a missions offering, and that is going to feed those four children. I think we'll say a little more about Pastor Amos. I think the interesting thing is that when God gives somebody some ministry, and it might be you, God will also give resources for that ministry, and such a resource was really um, reaching out to Pastor Cliff, who then flew there to Africa to be assisting with all this. And God has given Pastor Amos there a lot of interesting um, resources. One thing that I'm told, and you can share the story better than I, but that some 17 years ago, he thought that it was timely for him to be getting married, and he approached the prospective father-in-law, and in Nigeria, the thing to do is if you... Kenya. All right, sorry, Kenya. I'll get this right. In Kenya, you would uh, approach the fa prospective father-in-law, and he would say, well, for there to be a wedding, here is the dowry that is needed. This is something that would happen. And the dowry was going to be what? Two cows and two goats. Two cows and two goats. That would be presented to the family. Our friend Pastor Amos didn't have two cows and two goats or the money for that. And the father and the prospective father-in-law was warm-hearted and said, well, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and have a marriage, and we'll go ahead and start the family, and this is going to be kind of a special deal, and we can do this on the installment plan, and we'll have the wedding later. We'll have the wedding later. We'll have, we'll have the marriage. We'll have this all be right, but uh, we'll have the, the wedding ceremony, all the big things when the, uh, when the two cows and the two goats come along, and um, it's been 17 years. Has there been the wedding yet? No, it's going to be in about three weeks. And, and who's, who's going to do the wedding? And I'm going to be performing the wedding ceremony. You are? Having a public wedding. Now, he already has the two goats, and we're working on the two cows. <laughs> we're, we're trying to get there. All yeah. right. And so you've been asked to come and do the wedding service and also do a baptism service. Yes. He had contacted me. Um, he had, I uh, no. What teaching can he do for water baptism? And he had led some um, young people to the Lord. And I said, well, I shared scriptures. and do. So I've been teaching him and ministering to him. And then he presented that. And then he was going to do this water baptismal service. And two weeks ago, he informed me that when I come, I'll be doing the water baptismal service. He wants you to assist that with the very first baptism service for his church. That's right. Isn't that amazing? Well, let's go on and see some other pictures here. This is a picture of the interior of the church itself. What can you tell us about this place? Like um, in the African custom, the, on the far right in the picture, that's where most of the women sit. On the yeah. far left is where the men sit. Yeah. And anybody else is in between, and the, and the children are in the up in the front, but they still have that custom. They mm -hmm. still have their African traditions that sure. they still. And so what I see is what looks like a cement block building, and it looks to me like there's some plastic chairs, and it looks to me like there's a pulpit in front, and the people are gathering for worship. Yes, and most of the time they have electricity, and they have a man that plays a keyboard, but sometimes they don't have electricity. The electricity is kind of on and off where the church is, yeah. and, but Pastor Amos lives about another four miles down the road, and there's no electricity there. Here we see, I th presume that's you helping to minister to the people. Is that right? Yes. Um, I had been asked to speak at a men's uh, fellowship on a Saturday, and I gave a, a, 
uh, a passage and teaching. And then um, what, what the leader was saying, he said, well, you need to preach that in the church. And so I, I said, you really want me to give that same message in the church? Because some of them are going to be there. You gave a Saturday teaching to the men, and they said, let's do it again on Sunday morning. That's right. That's right. And, and they said, this same message needs to be happening in the church. I said, okay, I'll do that. And so I had all the, all the, here's the responsibility. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Mm -hmm. And everyone said, all the women said, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. All right. And so that's, that's kind of, it was kind of weak there too, but here it is. <laughs> <laughs> they need teaching, and so I'm giving the teaching. So you need some teaching too. <laughs> so here it is. Uh, so I, I had them do it. So, and I knew all the men, most of the men are on this side, and the women are on the other side. So I said, okay, all your husbands stand up, all your wives stand up, now come to the altar. So they all came to the altar, and I had them stand there, now join hands. They don't tend to do that in the public, especially in church. Well, that's the first time for everything. So, <laughs> so um, I mean, so they did that, and then I went to each couple, and I hold hands. I want you to hold your hand. And so I'm holding their hands together and then prayed over them. And then all the couples are there. And then finally with uh, Pastor Amos and, and his wife and praying for them. And that was something they'd never experienced before, to have that kind of a teaching in church. Maybe you could say a word briefly here. You and your wife had a long marriage. And so you have some experience in talking about this. Would you share a word about that? Yes. My wife went to be with the Lord. It will be four years in June. And if she would have lived till August, we would have been married 55 years. And we dated 44 years before that, so almost 60 years. It was a long and wonderful time, and now you're continuing in the Lord. I find this to be really fascinating. Some folks would say, I'm getting older, and there's changes in my life, and maybe I'll scale back from serving the Lord. You're going in the opposite direction. No. <laughs> I want God's will. You see, there's no real peace in your heart until you're obedient to God. Hello. That's right. You will have the greatest joy in your life when you are walking in the will of God. It may be different. You may not know what's coming down the road. You may not know what the next day is going to be. But know this, God's with you. And he'll lead you and guide you and minister to you. And so my heart's cry, I want God, I want your will. Your will be done in my life, no matter what. Your will, your perfect will. Let's see what's next. Here we have, you brought some funds along so you could get some Bibles for the church. And here we have some of the men stacking up the Bibles. Tell us about this project. Well, we had already raised um, almost $700 for Bibles. Um, and in Swahili, that's their, their, their language there, and a uh, local dialect. So we had the, that. And I had some money, still had some money in my pocket, uh, still having some available. And we needed some more Bibles because everybody didn't have a Bible. And so I made arrangements. And fortunately, there's a printing company in Kenya that prints the Bibles in Swahili and in the, 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 the dialect. And so uh, I said, let's go and get some more Bibles. So um, I had another $400. Um, I came home with $20, but I, we spent that on more Bibles. And there were Bibles... And these people have never had a Bible in their life. What you're telling me is that here is a pastor. Well, he was really a, a farmer or a leaf cutter, and he started a Bible study. God grew the Bible study in the church, and then he himself said, we don't have Bibles, and now they have Bibles. And he said, we don't have teaching about marriage, and you delivered teaching about marriage, and there's going to be a first baptism service. There's a lot happening. That's right. Praise the Lord. So here we have people with their Bibles. Now, we, they came forward and handed them out. And um, if you see the, the person that's third over in the purple, uh, the Bible I'm holding, I gave to her. And she had never touched a Bible before. And when she got that, she put it to her chest and began to weep. To know that 
she has her own Bible. She had, would share with others, and others would share with her. And how many of you have extra Bibles laying around? You don't think of it enough, but how valuable it is and what a blessing it is. Um, and these are brand new Bibles, not cast offs and people giving used Bibles. These are brand new Bibles that they had. And they, they, they respect the Word of God, and that's what they need. And we need to keep giving the Word of God. Well, our next picture, oh, this is how you're getting around. <laughs> yeah, um, I never saw so many motorbikes. I ride a motorcycle myself, um, but um, these are little um, Honda 125, 150s. They had a couple of Suzukis. Um, but to climb up the hills, a uh, quarter of a mile going up, and, and they have a lot of rain there. It's a rainy season, so you see that motorbike has an umbrella for the rider and also the passenger. Uh, and so that's what I did, climbing up hills. So they'd say that through the next meeting was at the top of that hill, and then they'd put you on the back of the bike, and up you'd go. That's right. That's right. Here we have something that's interesting. You've told me that one of the brothers in the church has brought together some 70 children that he's taken responsibility for in a children's center. Tell us about this. Yes, there's a, a lot of children that are unwanted. The po poverty is very, very great there. And so ch parents have abandoned their children. And I have one, there was a little baby that was uh, three months old. that a mother went, gave birth to the baby on the garbage dump, walked away from the baby, left there. Somebody heard the baby cry, picked up the baby, took it to um, Brother David's house, um, and the baby survived, and praise God. Um, so he's got over 70 children that's there. Some are orphans, but some are just abandoned children. Parents don't want them anymore. And so they're trying to raise some money to be a blessing and to help him to minister to the needs that are there. So he's got what looks to me like a, um, oh, a, a very basic sort of a building where he has care feeding, caring for some 70 children. Yes. And you've told me that the people of their little church, as impoverished as they are, bring their coins or their live offerings or anything to help support these children. What do they do? Yes, it was interesting. Um, I was there for their Thanksgiving uh, service. And in the Thanksgiving, I never saw a live chicken brought to church and put on the altar <laughs> before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. Uh, and, uh, but they had very little. But what they had, they gave. And so the idea is, as they said, it's Thanksgiving. We have dear ones we're caring for, and the people brought their gifts forward, including somebody who had a chicken with the feet tied together and brought that and laid it at the front. Amen. And that Amen. would be for the, for the children. That's right. But here's another one of the children there at the And uh, this, is, this is the child that was born on the garbage dump. The mother just uh, left the baby there crying. And is doing well, praise God. Ah, that's wonderful. Well, he, well, tell us about this picture. You're with some of the brothers together. Uh, well, this happens to be, that's the pastor's house, the thatch roof. Uh, that's, that was up a mountain, um, had to climb up there. Um, after this one, they had to get, it was a longer place. And you see the motorbike on the right um, to, for me, get up and down these places. Um, but this is where I did the teaching. This was the men's fellowship that we had there and, and had a meal then after the Bible study. And then that's when I shared about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and the responsibility there. And one of the men, and he said, this needs to be given in the church as well. So you did the men's fellowship right there in the pastor's home in the, under that thatch roof. And the men were so encouraged by it, they said, we need that a second time for our, for us, our wives, for our whole family. Amen. Amen. Let's see if we can go and join the people in worship there for a moment. Um, the way we're going to do this, I've got a little video, and Pastor Cliff has a number of videos. Some of them will have the ladies come up and sing in the front, and some of them have the men sing. The one that I was most um, touched by is one where there looks to me like a fairly young girl, and she comes up to the front and leads the singing, and everyone sings out with her at certain points. What language are they singing in? Um, is it Swahili? It's Swahili. Okay. Swahili. Well, 
Well, let's see if we can go to this. Here's the video, and maybe we'll have somebody there press play. And turn up the sound, please. <laughs> Like uh, that. And may I make a comment? Yes, sir. Pastor, I want to recommend recommend you. You have the youngest praise team I've ever seen in a church. <laughs> and you are you have the greatest praise team. I'll tell you, when I came in here, I felt the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God was here, and it was a blessing. And, and all those that are on that praise team, I really commend you and your your worship and praising the Lord. Well, thank you. I think what you're saying is whether here or there in Africa, to have young people lead out in praising the Lord is a good idea. Amen. That's Amen. what you say. Well, I am thinking about this. We go back to a picture with you and Pastor Amos and his wife, and you told me that on your return trip, and this was several months ago, you had a medical emergency on the plane. Yes. Um, when I left... Um, when I left where he lived, it was a four and a half hour drive to the airport um, uh, at, at Kissimmee. Then I got on a plane for two hours to go to, go to Nairobi. And from Nairobi, went then north to um, Amsterdam. And from Amsterdam, then to Detroit. And halfway across uh, there, uh, I had a hard time breathing. You were over the Atlantic Ocean, you stopped breathing. Yeah, it was a hard time breathing, <laughs> and, uh, and I can't talk. I don't feel I can talk. I had no energy. I couldn't even reach the button to get the attendant to come. So I had my cell phone, put a text message in, uh, disturb the lady next to me, and so she could read it and ask her to call for help. I can't breathe. And there was already a medical emergency on that plane um, an hour before this. And I'd been praying for a half hour, God help me, and it's not getting any better. I'm having a harder time. Sometimes when you pray, you don't get immediate results. You know what that's like. So you keep on praying, and then you believe God's going to do something yet. And so then, then there was another medical emergency, and praise God, there was a nurse, a medical doctor, and a cardiologist. So God provided a medical team for me. Mm -hmm. um, found out I had a... Uh, current, uh, blood clot in both lungs um, and it was very serious and the, um, the cardiologist diagnosed it as that and it was true. I went through six tanks of oxygen. They were going to, uh, they said that the pilot was going to divert the plane which was going to go into Canada then because now he's got two medical emergencies um, and all of a sudden I had s such strength and I said, no, I want to go to Detroit. Get me to Detroit. I can make it to Detroit. <laughs> oh, praise God. And so I said, okay, we're going to go to Detroit. So then we um, made it to Detroit. Ambulance was there. Went to the hospital. Did emergency surgery to remove the clot, uh, the artery from your heart to your lungs. Um, and then removed the blood clot from there. But I still had two blood clots in the lungs. And then found out, all oh, they couldn't find my gallbladder. So it's got to be there somewhere. So, <laughs> so they ended up saying, okay, let's give them, find another test here. So we ended up going back, and oh, they finally found it. It was highly inflamed. Um, and so I had another emergency surgery to remove the gallbladder. I was in intensive care for four and a half weeks, and praising God. And in that time, it was scary. But I'm telling you this I never had fear. I live my life with fear, but when you've come to the Lord Jesus Christ and know he's the healer and the deliverer, and, and I'm not afraid to die. I'm ready to go whenever God wants, but I'm, I'm going to believe God to keep me till his will is accomplished. And so I just believe in God. Well, in the hospital, in the, uh, oh, yeah, I also had donkey fever. I forgot. Um, 
Yeah, it was a little oversight. He, <laughs> he, he, he got an African fever while he was there. <laughs> yes. Uh, they, because when they were coming to see me, they had to wear a mask, um, cover their head, the gown, gloves, cover their feet, everything else. Um, so then, uh, but they couldn't understand something. It was in my blood. I had no symptoms of it whatsoever. Not one symptom of it. Of the dengue fever. Dengue fever, uh -huh. yes. So then, but I'm praying, looking to the Lord, and God spoke to me. Always be ready for this. In your hardest time, most difficult time, listen for a word from God. And God told me this. You shall not die but live to show forth the glory of God. And that's why I'm still here. I'm going to Kenya again in a few weeks. And, and then in September, October, going back to Australia. You have ministered many places. I wonder if we might pray for you today. I'm going to invite maybe Mr. Nimi and maybe Mr. Griffith to come forward. And we'd like to be in prayer for you personally in your ministry and certainly for Pastor Amos and the church in Kenya. And... Um, and just really thank the Lord for what he's doing. Perhaps I'll give the microphone here to Mr. Nimi. We'll have some prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for Pastor Cliff. Thank you for blessing us, blessing him. Thank you for carrying him through so many wonderful things, Lord, for using him to bless others and also bless us here today with the story he told us, Lord. Father, it's, it's hard not to be moved to see the great story that you write for those who are willing to surrender to you, Lord. So, Father, I don't know what else I can say for Pastor Cliff, but we pray for him. We pray that you would just continue to strengthen him, to keep him healthy, to do the work you called him to do, Lord, and to use him to bless others, Lord. We pray for this church in Kenya and the pastor and his wife. We pray that this wedding would go well. We pray that many people would be drawn to you, to know you, so that it would be saved from hell and be brought to heaven to rejoice with us. Lord, so we just thank you for this pastor, and we just pray for your continued protection and continued peace to be upon him, Lord. In Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have defeated the grave. We thank you that you are alive. And therefore, each and every one of us here and even in Kenya who have been born on a dump trash, they have hope. We have hope, and it's because of you. We thank you for that hope that you give. When there's darkness all around, even through the darkness, light shines out of darkness. You are the light, and I thank you for the light that you have revealed to each and every one of us and that you are shining through this man here, Pastor Cliff. And I pray that you would continue to show that light just like you had spoken to him in that hospital bed, that his life would not end until you, you would glorify yourself through him. And as he goes forth to Kenya and to Australia, God, I pray that you would do just what you have told him you're going to do, that through him, light would shine forth into darkness and that the darkness would flee, that the captives would be set free and that the truth would be proclaimed. I pray that your spirit would speak through him, and that through that speaking there would be a mighty anointing, that husbands and wives would learn to love each other, that children would learn to worship Jesus, and that they would know that there is a Savior and that there is hope in this world and in this life. Let your light shine through this man. Glorify yourself through him. Sustain him. Strengthen him. And bless him and may many scores upon scores come to know that Jesus is the Savior of the world and have eternal life and be born again. We ask you do it for your glory. Amen. Brother Cliff, I wonder if you'd stay right here with me for one more minute. I'm going to ask the worship group to come forward. I wonder if all of you, the rest of us in the congregation might stand. And I'm going to ask Brother Cliff if he might... Do us the privilege of um, praying for us as a church. Would you do that for us? Praying yes. for these dear people, these families, for our church. Yes, my, my joy and privilege and honor. Um, as I came in here, and I see all you that are here, and praise God for you. And as the worship team began to worship, 
Um, but the sense of the Spirit of God is so great. The Spirit of God, the presence of God is really here. Bask in it. Bask in it. Receive it. Be open to it. Because where the presence of the Lord is, his power is there. Respond to it. Open yourself to it for his will to be accomplished in your life. Here, um, looking around, I've got to be the oldest person here. There's so many young people here. Listen, make your life count for the Lord. Make your life count for Jesus. There's nothing more important than to serve him and follow him and yield yourself to him. Never know where he might lead you. You may never go to another country or another foreign land, but there's people at work or at school, people you come in contact with. Be the shining light that will minister to them. Be the instrument of righteousness that is going to be a blessing to them. And because Christ is risen, the power of the resurrection has been manifested. And because you are here and you know Jesus Christ, that the power of the resurrection is in you. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, as we've come together in the name of Jesus. Lord, as we celebrate the empty tomb. Hallelujah. Praise God. The blessing of the empty tomb. He is not here. He is risen. Praise God. And may the power of your spirit be so manifested in the lives of everyone this year, every adult, every child, every young person. And Lord God, and that the anointing, oh God, will just flow through them and touch those around about them. We all face discouragement. We all face frustrations and difficulties. But, oh, God, that we need to be encouragers of one another. Help us, Lord, to bless one another. Help us to share the word of God and the, the blessing of the Lord that maketh rich and ethno sorrow, that it will touch hearts and lives around about, and that every need will be met. And, Lord God, and that from this, this congregation, that there will be, they raise up Bible teachers, and there will be pastors and teachers and missionaries, oh, God, that will go around the world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is alive, hallelujah, and coming again. Bless them abundantly by the peace and power of your Holy Spirit. And, Lord, and I just thank you for this man of God. I just thank you for Pastor Paul. I just thank you for the, his heart, oh, God. There are many, many ministers that are ministers, but they, they don't have been carried the the burden and the heaviness of the ministry as he does and the desire to serve you and follow you. And Lord, as this man of God, I just thank you for the privilege of just recently getting to meet him and know him and now have him as a friend. And Lord God, that your anointing and blessing will just be multiplied upon him. And as he leads his congregation, as he has an outreach and a, and a passion and love for the word of God, and for the spreading of the gospel, just anoint him and his family. Meet their every need. Comfort their heart. Bless his wife, Lord God, and use them for your glory and honor. And that this church will be, um, continue to be a lighthouse and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us have a concluding song, and then we'll give an instruction about a, a breakfast to follow. Let us sing together. I believe in Jesus, I believe He is the Son of God, I believe He died and rose again, I believe He paid for our soul, and I believe is here now. I believe he is here.
standing in our midst, standing here with the power to heal now, with the power to heal and the grace to will conclude our empty tomb service. We'll put a slide on the screen that shows our schedule for today in that our schedule on this Easter Sunday is different from typical. 9.30, it says we have a breakfast together. That's now. The breakfast will be served in the gymnasium, and so as soon as we're dismissed, you can head there to the gym, and there are places to be seated in the gym and, of course, in the fellowship hall, both, and you can spread out to either spot. And then we'll regather an hour from now at 10.30 for our main worship service. We'll have a wonderful time praising the Lord, hearing teaching from God's word. We'll do that at 1030. Lord, we pray that you'd bless this breakfast, our fellowship with one another, and all that we do this morning. In Jesus' name, and amen. Let us head for breakfast. <laughs>